Good evening. A couple prayer requests. Uh, let's pray for Gary. He's going to be traveling this weekend. He's going back to Canada for the weekend. He has a four-day weekend, so let's uh, pray for that. Let's pray for this holiday weekend, Fourth of July weekend um, coming up. Let's also pray for my wife. Uh, she just has not felt good for the past few weeks and especially this last week so let's keep her in prayer and let's turn to psalm 60 psalm 60 hold your finger on psalm 60 and then turn to jeremiah 17 jeremiah 17 and what i share tonight is going to be brief um, instead of three or four points like i usually do i'm going to do 10 but they're going to be brief ten points. So uh, let's pray. Lord, we thank you as we look into your word tonight that we would learn something tonight, Lord, that would be of eternal benefit, Lord. Lord, that you would teach us. Teach me, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Jeremiah 17, verses 5 through 7. Thus saith the Lord. When you hear that, that's important. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, who maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. And we see something here already is that when we start trusting in flesh and man, then it's because our heart has departed from the Lord. We're no longer trusting in him. We can't trust in flesh and trust in him both. For he shall be like the heath in the desert and shall not see when good comes. Won't even recognize it. But shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in the salt land and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. So when we trust in the flesh, it's going to be a rough way to go. Not only that, something good happens, we won't even recognize it. We won't even see it coming, and it'll be have come and gone. The opportunities that we have will come and go before we even know it. But blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, whose hope the Lord is. In other words, when I hope in the Lord, then I'm going to be blessed. So in thinking of this, of trusting in the Lord and not trusting in flesh, I've come to the conclusion that this has to be a revelation by the Holy Spirit. Because when you share this with someone, even Christians, they many times use reasoning like, well, God helps those who help themselves. Show me that in the Bible, right? God helps those who help themselves. I can't just lay around and pray. I've got to be doing something. But the Holy Spirit teaches us in a lot of scriptures, and he teaches us a great deal in scripture about our inferiority compared to God, God's superiority and God's supremacy. We are inferior, he is superior, and we're blessed when we trust in him. And David displays this in Psalm 60. Psalm 60, it's a short psalm. I'm only going to, use the la or I'm only going to uh, read the last two verses. But Israel, it seems in this psalm, as we read through the psalm, seems like they have suffered a defeat in battle. And that's the impression that we get as we read this, that they have been defeated in battle. And the last two verses of this, as David has been lamenting what has happened, he says, give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of man. Through God we shall do valiantly, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies. How helpful would that be right now to Ukraine? Because every time I listen to the news, I'm hearing Send us more weapons. Send us more of this. We need people to help us. We need people to fight for us. 
We need NATO. We need the European Union. But to go to the Lord and say, give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of man. Through God we will do valiantly. And I'm sure there are people that are praying this. For he it is that shall tread down our enemies. So the Holy Spirit reveals us. And I'm going to share some scriptures. I'm going to go through and share them. And that's really all I have tonight. But the Holy Spirit teaches us about man's inferiority in Psalm 60, 11, first off. Give us aid against the enemy. For the help of man is worthless. With God we will gain the victory and he will trample down our enemies. So what do we do? We ask God to help us to avoid human dependency that may supplant my trust for the Lord. Does that mean I should never rely on anybody? My car's broken down and I call and say, hey, can you give me a ride? There's nothing wrong with that. But I do not allow dependency on people to supplant my trust in the Lord. The Lord, the Holy Spirit, exposes every person's sinful human tendency. Job wrote this in Job 25, 4 and 5. How can then, can a man be righteous before God? How can one be born of woman be pure? If even the moon is not bright and the stars are not pure in his eyes, how much less a man who is but a, and in this version it uses, is a maggot or a worm, a son of man who is only a worm. And he's saying in comparison to God, as we, and as we spoke this last weekend, when we look around creation, it is immense. The universe is Tremendous. It is immense. What am I in comparison to a whole planet or a star or the moon? I am tiny and of little consequence. If I were gone, the world would not notice, but for very few. But if the moon was gone, we would notice right away. If the sun was gone, but he said, how can a man be righteous before God? How puffed up we are in how valuable we are. God says though that we are more valuable to him than the whole world, one soul. But when we are puffed up in our self-worth we are very weak and helpless. We ask the Lord to help us and we don't forget that everyone's heart is deceitful and desperately wicked before him, and prone to sin. The third point, the Holy Spirit draws sharp contrast between the wisdom of man and the wisdom of God. In 1 Corinthians 3, 18 through 20, Paul wrote, Do not deceive yourselves. If any one of you thinks he is wise by the standards of this age, he should become a fool so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of the world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. 1 Corinthians 3, 18 through 20. When we think that we are wise according to the standards of the world, it's interesting because I was listening recently to this trial of a politician, a corrupt politician, a, an accused corrupt politician. And the people that knew him said, well, you know, he was a very intelligent person, and he knew he was intelligent, and he always felt like he was the smartest person in the room. And because of this, he was very arrogant. And now he's looking at a long prison sentence and very likely to receive this. Wise by the standards of this age, but we 
it profits us, profits us to become fools that we can truly allow God to be wise in our lives. For the wisdom of the world's foolishness in God's sight, he catches the wise in their craftiness. The Lord knows the thoughts of the wise are futile. We need to ask the Lord to help us to remember and not become upset or to remember that there is superiority in his wisdom and his knowledge and his understanding in contrast to the wisest people. Why is that? God sees everything from the end to the beginning or the beginning to the end. He's not restricted by time as we see only present and a short distance into the past. But he is omnipresent. He sees everything from every perspective. His knowledge and understanding is in sharp contrast to even the wisest people, far surpassing them. The Holy Spirit spotlights God's complete truthfulness versus the nature of people. Moses wrote, God's not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Numbers 23, 19. God's not a man that he should lie. Have you ever asked, as Ray Comfort would do, he would ask on the street, have you ever told a lie? And there were some people that would say, well, no, I never have. And he would say, well, you just told one. And he would pin them down on that. But God is not as a man. He's not unrighteous. And he doesn't lie. He doesn't make promises that he doesn't keep. We're not to become so upset when people betray us. Because it is in the nature of the flesh. They're going to speak falsely against us. Or they're going to tell lies to cover up a mistake. But when we rely on the truth of God, we're set free. The Holy Spirit reminds us that we're creations of the Almighty Creator. David wrote in Psalms 8, 3 and 4, and he wrote it again in 103, 15 and 16. He says, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. Man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower in the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone. And its place remembers it no more. We have to remember we're a creation of God and this life is a finite time that we're here and that we're gone and we are limited by this life that we live now but in Christ we have eternity the Holy Spirit instructs us that the ultimate salvation success and reward does not depend on human effort but on God's mercy for going to have salvation if we're going to be successful if we're going to receive reward it's not going to be because of human effort. We're going to receive from God what we do not deserve and not receive what we do. Is God unjust? Not at all. Romans 9, 14 through 17. Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. It does not therefore depend on man's desire or effort but on God's mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I may display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. In all the earth. Ask the Lord to help us to trust and obey him, regardless of whether we think we're getting what we deserve. How many times do you hear people say, well, that's not fair. 
And grace is not fair. It is me getting what I don't deserve, but it is very unfair to God. The Holy Scripture humbles anyone who thinks they are indispensable or more important than others. Paul wrote to the bickering Corinthians. After all is Apollos. What after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. And we ask the Lord to help us remember that we are merely vessels that he works through and that we may be used for honor or dishonor, depending on how much we're willing to trust and obey and be available to God. Total reliance, total submission, as Chris taught on Sunday night, that salvation is free, but discipleship costs everything. When we become disciples, we make ourselves available as a vessel. The Holy Spirit discloses how little people really understand about God and His will. Solomon wrote this in Ecclesiastes 8.17. No one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all his efforts to search it out, Man cannot discover its meaning. Even a wise man claims he knows. Even if a wise man claims he knows, he cannot really comprehend it. We need to seek the Lord for his wisdom that we can have a revelation of him and that he can remind us as humans how little we understand of him and his will but that we submit to his leading because many times he only reveals enough for one more step and then he will reveal for the next step and by faith we follow this. The Holy Spirit urges us to focus our attention on knowing and loving God instead of admiring great people. And history is full of great people that we could admire. There are current day people that are practically worshipped. But Jeremiah wrote this in Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Let, the wise, let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast about this, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. Ask the Lord to help us focus more on thinking and our resources and energies into pleasing the Lord instead of the powerful, rich, or intelligent people. And it's just natural in our flesh that when someone is talented, gifted, intelligent, that we can become very admiring of them. And it doesn't mean that we can't acknowledge the attributes of people, but we do not get into an admiration of them that exceeds what we have for God. The Holy Spirit uses historical examples to point out how many people miserably failed. Paul wrote this, we speak of God's wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8. We ask the Lord, we can ask the Lord to Use historical examples to teach others of the futility of relying on anything but his wisdom, his power, his love. The wisdom, power, and love of Almighty God. And I want to read those two verses from another version. The King James. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom 
which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And it's interesting to see that God used the wickedness of this world to attain the greatest victory, and that is our salvation. That the wicked men of this world crucified Christ, and if they knew that in doing so, they were giving victory to the Lord, they wouldn't have crucified him because it was the ultimate defeat of Satan.